Thomas and Aaron. Our guest today is a very special man. Not just because he talks to millions of New Yorkers on a daily basis, but because he defies stereotypes, transcends ideology, and cares no more about political correctness than he does about towing any particular line. What he cares about, I think, at his core is his nation, the greatest mankind has ever known. And in doing so, he brings true heart and soul to a landscape that is not usually accused of having much of it. That being the landscape of talk radio. He tells us, I wanted to be a Black Panther when I was a teenager, then became part of a 30 plus year phenomenon that revived conservatism. What caused the change in me? In reality, there was no change. I've always cared about people and I've always been about solutions. I've always been a conservative, and sometimes I still wear a black beret. And he does something that is not just critically important in our society today, but which I believe is critically American. And that is that he asks the hard questions. He says, society calls it child abuse when a parent smacks their kid on the ass for getting out of line. But why don't we consider it abusive to let children go to school for 12 years and not learn how to read, write, speak the English language, and compete in the workplace? If you've watched or listened to this podcast at all, you know that we are very interested in the true history of this incredible nation and that I have a somewhat unorthodox view of it. I believe that the true origin of this great nation does not start with the revolution in 1776, nor even with the Dutch colony of New Netherland a century and a half before that. But in really examining this overall epic story, it has become evident to me that the real origin of our United States of America is in essence a Catholic priest who in 1517 published his 95 theses in protest to what he saw as the questionable practices of the Catholic Church at the time, which was, at the time, the Holy Roman Empire. Church and state as one in the same, and therein lay the problem. And the, the truth is that this priest was not any kind of troublemaker. In fact, he felt very guilty about even voicing these questions at all. But ultimately, what he was was committed to his profession, and to his God. And nobody was going to impede on that relationship, not even the most powerful empire on earth. And from that conviction, he felt that it was his duty to ask the hard questions. And he asked what were possibly the hardest and most dangerous questions one could ask in that day, because you simply did not question the Holy Roman Empire in 1517 let alone question the Pope. But this unwaveringly devout priest named Martin Luther did just that, and he changed the world because of it. Well, our guest today not only asks the hard questions, but he does it without screaming at anyone. <laughs> Though, if they happen to be bordering on delusional, he may gently point that out to them. Not only does he speak with equal eloquence and authority on the state of current events, domestic and international, but he does it while infusing an unapologetic eclecticism. For this gentleman can wax poetic on the mastery of Santana's guitar while lauding the timeless gravity of Barry White, the genius of Jim Croce, the nostalgic bliss of the seemingly immortal Johnny Mathis, the unfettered brilliance of Stevie Wonder, and just this week, respectfully mourns the passing of an icon, the coal miner's daughter herself, Loretta Lynn. Yet when asked about the single greatest live show he ever attended, that would be none other than ACDC. <laughs> this is my kind of guy. He's also a piece of our own living history in this incredible place that we now call New York. You see, the station that he has made a career at, going back over four decades now, now celebrates its 100th year on the air. 
And this man himself was instrumental in the great resurgence of AM radio in his work at this historic station. So, <laughs> damas and Aaron, mesdames et messieurs, damas y caballeros, ladies and gentlemen, I am greatly honored to introduce the coolest man and quite possibly the coolest head on talk radio today. A gentleman who goes by the pseudonym of Bo Snurdly, but whom I am happy and proud to call the one and only the magnificent Mr. James Golden. Welcome in here. I have never had an introduction like that ever in my <laughs> life. I thank you. Uh, you get me in ways that no one else has understood what I'm, who I am. And wow, that was incredible. Well, I'm glad you're not yelling at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Let me just add, I know yeah. what you were talking about as soon as you started talking about the priest, I, that it, 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 it twinged my ear, and I'm like, wait a minute, what is this? And as soon as you started describing it, I said, oh, he's talking about Martin Luther. But Martin Luther's story would not be Martin Luther's story without Henry VIII. Because what happened, we can't ignore what Henry VIII did. And I know the salaciousness of his, of, of, of his reign, you know, of course, produces great TV shows like The Tudors and everything else. But he was, he was really the first world power king to say, you know what? No, I'm not going with this Pope thing. They won't give me a divorce. He did it for purely selfish reasons. He's not going to give me the divorce. No, I'll start my own church. Well, that was the beginning of a foundation that also was an earthquake around the world and changed the world. And if you look at the, the sequence of events, what Henry VIII did led to the Magna Carta in a strange way. Because now all of a sudden you have the king proclaiming himself to be pretty much a god. And the, the power that the kings in England assumed then led to the dissatisfaction among the noble class. who We have rights too. Your, your, your power doesn't just emanate from yourself and from God. We have to have rights too. So hence the Magna Carta. I'm overly simplifying this, of course. But without the Magna Carta, there would be no Declaration of Independence. There would be no United States Constitution. The Magna Carta was the first time that men attempted to explain why they had the right to be governed by themselves along with the authoritarian rule of the day. Without that, there would be no United States. That's at least my contention of it. There you go. I, I, knew, I knew there was a reason I really liked you. Um, and th th that really comes down to asking the questions, right? Having the courage and the, the foresight to ask the hard questions and not take things at face value. Having the, having the that's part of it, but also having the courage to face the consequences. And we can see that throughout history, whether it was Galileo, whether it was Martin Luther. And by the way, these, and, and one of the lessons about Martin Luther is he himself was a flawed individual. He was a terrible anti-Semite um, by today's standards. And, and so what do we learn from history? We learn that in almost every age, there are flawed people and flawed nations. But yet, because we're this dichotomy of being flawed human beings, even flawed people can produce great things. And we don't go back in history and look at all the flaws and let that define the person. We look at the greatness that they brought usually and say, well, this is what they gave us as a great contribution in the world. We do that except when it comes to America, where, where all of a sudden every flaw in American history has to be amplified magnified and i'm not saying it should ever be swept under the rug i think an honest appraisal of history is what we need but we should also recognize the greatness that comes america has brought more freedom to more people more liberty to this world than any other nation on the face of the earth and so to simply try to say okay we were a slave nation and we had horrible atrocities here is not the full scope of what america is there's no reason for kids to grow up hating this country instead of revering and loving this country 
for the wonderful contributions that it has brought to the world. Exactly. It is the life. It is the, the, the as Thomas Paine said, the cause of America is in great measure the, the cause of all mankind. And that's exactly. true. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You uh, people listen to you every day and you have a great audience at a great station, but you're a great listener. And I, and I don't nece I don't necessarily mean just with your ears. You listen to people and to what's going on in the world. You said it in your book. I read people. I read voices. That requires listening. Where did that come from? It came from uh, my desire when I moved from the talk radio to the talk radio side of the business, from the music side of the business to be exceptional at what I do. I just, I've always wanted to be the best at what I do, not be mediocre. And I discovered very early on that if you're going to be even in background support of a talk show and my duties, responsibilities, part of them were making sure that I had the right callers lined up and that I had to really listen to what these people were saying, to question people, to actually uh, ascertain whether what I was being told was true or not, and and then make a determination whether they would go on. I worked for the most successful radio program in American history, and it was pretty demanding. My former boss was, uh, aside from just being an incredible human being, incredibly generous human being, um, incredibly motivated to be the best himself, uh, he was he he was a, a, a the goat the greatest of all time for many of us in this business because he he knew he loved radio like like many of us who work in the radio business it, it's certainly not the money in the first few years or decades that you work in radio because unless you you have reached the, the pinnacle of it you're not making a lot of money if, especially if you're behind the scenes it's the love of what you're doing. And so he loved, my, my former boss loved the industry just the way that, that I loved it. And you want to be the best at something. And so you work at it. And that's one of the things I discovered. You really had to take the role seriously and give it your best. Your former boss was somebody who I listened to somewhat, or more in the early years, but um, I, I learned a lot about him in your book. One of the things that really jumped out at me was that he he ha he he told you to bring up the callers who opposed his views first. The the ones who were going to are you know disagree. He wanted to talk to them first. Right, right, and that was always that was from day one that he wasn't afraid. He loved the idea of being able to persuade people, which is an art. It, it it's one thing to argue with people. But he wanted to be able to persuade people that his way of thinking was right and to demonstrate that he had a mastery of the facts of the information and he had such a manner that he could persuade people. He persuaded millions of people over the years to identify as conservatives. And these are people who came from all backgrounds of life. Look, for me, as well-read as I was coming into the show, and I was, and as politically active as I was in terms of at least keeping up with news ever since I was a kid, I was always engaged in, in both the music side and the political side. It, it's, it's, uh, I wrote my first letter to the editor when I was a teenager. Uh, so as conscious as I was politically, I did not self-identify as a conservative until he actually explained to his audience what conservatism was. And it's like, well, wait a minute. I'm one of those. That's those are the things that I believe in, and they're things that most Americans believe in. By the way, uh, of the idea that you can work hard and you should, uh, you should work hard. The idea that that we are we should be moving toward a merit based society, not just handing out rewards for identity. Uh, you should actually, and those, by the way, are the words of Dr. King. Uh, synthesized, which is we should judge people by the content that they bring to life, their character, not by something as superficial as a skin color. Okay. And so these ideals are American ideals. They are what many of us, what was the social contract for many years in America? 
I, I tell people it is what allowed my dad and his generation of people to love this nation and to go fight for this nation, even when this nation discriminated against them and would not give them a fair shake because the ideals were bigger than the times, the ideals of what America was. And that's what Dr. King spoke to too, for America living up to the promise that it made its people. And these people understood that things in history are not perfect. They don't happen necessarily in a day or a lifetime, but they do happen over a period of time. They have a long view of life and a long view of history. And indeed, we've seen much of that happen in our lifetimes. Most of the things that um, that America had promised its citizens early on that remained unfinished has now been codified into law, has now been put into practice. There are remedies on the books when people are, 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 are discriminated against. There are remedies when, when systems, when institutions fail to honor their commitment to the people. And that's up to us to exercise them, but they've been done. It's not, we don't live in the 1950s, in the 1920s. And things have changed dramatically just in our own lifetime to bring forth the kind of America that we all wanted. Your former boss was a gentleman named Rush Limbaugh. Yes, and... greatest broadcaster in American history. And I love him dearly then, and I love him now. And, and, and you know, I understand that there are people who bought into the the media caricature of Rush and the media portrayals of Rush. But I worked with Rush for 30 years. And even before I worked with him, I knew him. And I will tell people he was the finest of men. He was the finest of human beings. He was deeply generous to people. And the generosity that he did, people don't even think about this, the money that he raised for leukemia and uh, a research, which was, I believe, probably close to a billion dollars during the time that he was on the air, has now translated into people from all walks of America finding cures for the deepest disease that has taken out so many lives and brought such pain and misery to people. Those are the kind of things that concerned him. And those are the kind of things he worked with. He was deeply concerned about education and actually the, uh, wrote a series of books to try to correct what was being mistaught about American history. He was a man that cared about his staff. Most of the people that worked for him, and we had every, we were a crosswalk on our staff of American life. We had gay, we had Democrat, we had liberals, we had everybody. There was no litmus test, except that you had to be excellent at what you did. You had to really be good at what you do because we didn't have a lot of meetings, we didn't have a lot of structure. What we had was leadership. Rush was the kind of guy that you, I hired you to do this job, do your job. That was it. Go back for a minute. Rush Limbaugh had on his staff gays, yes. liberals, yes. Democrats, yes. people from all walks of life. Didn't yes, they? and everybody stayed because we all loved him. It wasn't just, look, how many times do you hear that? Most people gripe and moan about their boss. The common refrain that you heard from people that worked with Rush in our organization was how much we all loved our boss. It was a deep love and loyalty for him and loved us. And, and James, he didn't mind if people disagreed with him, did he? No, not at all. Look, I, I, was, I sat across from him in the studio for years. I had the freedom that if I disagreed with him, while he was on the air, I just hit the intercom and said, you're wrong. And, then, and of course, that would usually uh, lead to him backing me up into a corner about why I was saying it and then having to say, oh, well, maybe you're not wrong about that. But it was a, it was fun as well. There's a lot of emotions in politics, right? Yeah. It's, it's not unlike road rage at times. True. And. Well, as we just said, Rush didn't mind if people disagreed with him. And, and I, I never heard him demonize people uh, no, on the other side. No. And I certainly never hear you do that or even attack anybody. But, James, the attacks and the demonization of a guy like Rush Limbaugh from the other side, from people that don't agree with him, are, is really scary. 
because he was a threat to the power base of a political party. And that becomes something. And I, you know, I had a talk with him once. I remember saying to him once, um, we were talking about climate change. And this was not in this, not on the air. This was an off the air remark. And I said, Rush, you don't seem to grasp that your opposition to climate change, you're the only thing that has that has stood in the way of America being swept over the edge on this idea of man-made global warming. And of course, the hatred for you uh, because of that. There are billions of dollars riding on this. There are entire industries riding on this. And there are people who have vested interest in making sure that people believe certain ideologies. And so when you stand in, 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 in the way of what they consider to be their profits, or their, ideolo their ideological position spreading. These people have deep hatred for you. You are an obstacle. And that's what he was. He was telling the truth. He was being logical. He was telling every uh, the way that he saw it. And he would, by the way, take on all comers on this. Mm -hmm. But the opposition wasn't content to just say you're wrong. They have to demonize. It's a blood sport. They have to try to take you out. And it's not just um, as a talk radio figure that happens in American politics all the time. It's no longer let let's let's agree to disagree and be civil. It's no let's damage the other person and damage them as a human being so much that they lose credibility. That's the opposition. And I tell you something that is a horrible way to to run in a political arena. And I hope we as a country can get back to the days when we can have very strong, very passionate disagreements with each other without this personal destruction. Communication is defined in, in at least one or two dictionaries as the imparting or exchanging of information or news. Um, you can't do that without listening. And I know that you, you, I know your views and I know the way, way you lean generally on a lot of topics, but you don't toe the line. And one of the better examples that, uh, that I can give of that is is a report that you did on on the Brianna Taylor case, not too long ago, about a month or so ago. Can can you talk a little bit about that? And this is very sad to me. Brianna Taylor, of course, you know, many of us have knee jerk reactions when it when it comes to police because, of course, we want to defend those who defend us. But this was clearly a case of horrible mistaken identity. As it turns out, the police officers, and this isn't well known because it hasn't been publicized as much. As it turns out, the, now some of the police involved admitted that they had falsified information for the search warrant. They went to basically the, a place looking for her ex-boyfriend who wasn't even there. The current boyfriend who was armed, they went with a no-knock warrant. So someone's banging on the door, bangs into the apartment. Of course he defends himself. And then they tried to charge him with murder when, in fact, the police shot her and tried to kill them, all based on falsified information. And he has had his name, the boyfriend, horribly run through the press as being some kind of drug dealer and everything else. But in fact, no, this is an upstanding citizen who found himself in the middle of something beyond his control. And to this day, he's still trying to get his reputation back. And this was a case where the police, they misfired in any number of ways. And it cost this woman her life. It was falsified information on a warrant. That ought to scare everybody. The police framing somebody based on a hunch. And I'm sorry, as much as I love the police, I'm not going along with that behavior. I don't go along with the behavior that you get from road cops. I grew up in a neighborhood where we watched young children being killed by police, murdered. And these things happen, America, they do. And I'm yes, I believe that 99% of our law enforcement people are doing it for the right reasons. They're out here, they wanna protect us. They deserve and they've earned our support and I do support them. I will not support rogue policing and we have rogue policing. And you know, think about this. I ask people to think about this, this because we look at, you know, many of, of, of the people have seen reports in our country 
where police officers go into neighborhoods and, and the most vile things happen in these neighborhoods. And they ask the citizens, who did this? Who did this? And then you end up with these, well, you know, snitches end up with in ditches with stitches. And they won't talk. And they people look down their nose, oh, how horrible. These people won't even help the police find out who murdered these children. Well, what is your police force? We call the same thing when they do it a blue wall of silence. They know who the road cops are. They won't come forward and say, these people don't belong in our profession. And then you go to the FBI and you see the same, occur a th same thing occurring. Right now, there are finally whistleblowers coming out to talk about some of the uh, 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 incompetence and the corruption, political corruption, that has infested the FBI. The same thing with people that are talking about what's going on at the DOJ. And I contend to America that the FBI has been corrupt since its inception. This is nothing new. The fact that Herbert Hoover's name is on that, I mean, I'm not, I'm sorry, J. Edgar Hoover's name is on that building is a disgrace. He was a criminal pretending to be America's highest lawman. He spied on American citizens. He spied on politicians, including presidents of the United States. He is not a hero and never was a hero. And that's what I mean about being honest with our history. Does it mean that that all the great men and women at the FBI should be castigated? No, we've had great people there. But let's be honest about who we are as well. These are these are things that you you don't hear a lot. You don't hear this this what I hear from you is truth. You're a truth seeker. You you really listen. You don't care about party lines, so to speak. You you want to get to the to the heart of it. And it's not it's not who you work for. It's not the station. It's not John Casamitidis telling you to do it's you. It's in your heart. Yeah. Look, I want this America. I want the America the where we can trust our government. I want people to be able to trust their police departments. Their police departments deserve to be trusted for the wonderful work that they do to protect us. We cannot let a few rogue people define our government agencies. When we do, we're in danger of collapsing the whole system. We have to be brave enough to demand the excellence that makes America an exceptional nation. With that, I want to skip right to the topics that I don't want to forget. Um, let's talk about the borders real quick. What is going on at our borders? Disgrace. Number one, the asylum program is such a farce. And what we have that still remains unreported, and this almost sounds like it's on the verge of coop conspiracy stuff, and I assure you it's not. We have a reporter down there, Todd Benzman, who I've interviewed any number of times with the Center for Immigration Studies, who documents what is going on. And what is going on with the asylum program is, number one, you have people coming in from Central America. They go through Mexico. They're asked, why are you coming here? We want to go to America. Why do you want to come to America? They say they're coming here for a specific economic reason. And then they're turned away. Well, then they're not sent back to Central America. They're directed to uh, locations where they are re-interviewed and re-interviewed. And thanks to one is being run by a group of Jesuit priests, the other is being run with funding from the United Nations. And they are given stories, or I'm sorry, they recover stories from their past where they were traumatized or whatever it was that would allow them to apply for, for asylum. It is a farce. And our entire system is being predicated on this farce. I'm not saying they're not legitimate asylum seekers, but they're nowhere near the numbers of people that are flooding through the asylum program. As you know, we have an open borders program right now where many illegals just walk through. They just walk in and they're here. And by the way, that has resulted in the deaths of children in the Rio Grande River every single week. No one reports on those children. Their lives don't matter. It has resulted in more human trafficking at the borders, more increased fentanyl coming into the country in numbers that are astounding. And yet there's nothing that this administration wants to do about correcting any of it. Why? They have an open borders agenda. And the true reasons why, um, if you talk about it, they will call you a racist. And I, by they, I mean the left. 
But for years, the Democrats proudly talked about the browning of America, that America was no longer going to be a nation where white people were the majority. And that we would, and they said, and these Republicans, they told us, the Republicans had better get used to the browning of America because it's happening. Well, now all of a sudden, Republican Democrats are saying, oh, these Republicans, they're evil. That's what they're scared of. They're scared of the browning of America. No, this is what the Democrats wanted as a political agenda because they felt that they could own the brown, the black vote. And with the coalition that they had, they would be in power forever. And the power forever means they also control the purse strings. And if you think that's not significant, look at where the money is being spent. We have infrastructure bills where very little of the money is being spent on infrastructure. It's being handed out in slush funds to various groups. We have environmental bills where billions of other dollars are being handed out to groups. We don't even know who these groups are. But in other words, it's just a self-perpetuation of money laundering. The Democrats are laundering this money to their NGOs, to their groups, and in turn, they get donations and they remain in power and they and their constituents get rich. How do we impose term limits on all elected offices? Federal now, see, and state? I don't agree with term limits. And as really? the way it's called, I don't. The term limits are an informed electorate. We have elections every two years. If you want to term limit your congressman, then term limit them out. And by the way, this means if you're in the opposition, then run candidates that can actually beat these people. And don't be afraid. In order to do that, though, you have to go into neighborhoods that you might not want to go into. So you can't sit home and sit up in your nice little enclave and bitch about how awful American cities are unless you actually want to go in there and go in and change it. Democrats have no problem going into wherever they want to change. They want to change Texas. Look at what they are doing. They're organizing and flooding in Texas to try to change that. They changed Colorado. They had a blueprint called the, uh, well, I forgot the name of the blueprint, but it was on how to turn Colorado from a red state into a blue state. They've implemented it. Look at what they've done in California. If you want to take these, if you want to compete, go back to these places and start working there and organizing and compete. I remember conservatives and many of my friends laughed themselves silly at Barack Obama. Eh, 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 eh. He's just a community organizer. Eh, 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 eh. Well, Mr. Community Organizer got into the White House and put together a machine that's still kicking Republicans' butts in some cases. Yeah, he was a community organizer. You may want to try it, organizing a community and then watching the power that derives from that instead of sneering and laughing at it. Let's skip to another topic. You've called COVID the biggest scandal in human history. It is the biggest scandal in human history. I, I don't disagree. We with have that. millions of people that have had this, billions of people that were threatened with this disease, millions that have had it in some form or another, and deaths that we still don't know the right number because so many people were inflicted with it, but we don't know whether they actually died of COVID or something else. We have medicines that cost pennies on the dollar that we were told by the mainstream press in America be, that didn't work. Why? Because they hated the president, the then president, who had suggested that they be used. We had phony peer study, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, phony medical studies that were later peer reviewed and found to be false that said these medicines like hydroxychloroquine and others did not work. When in fact, I am alive partially because of hydroxychloroquine because I had a severe uh, a case of COVID and was near death when my frontline doctor said, okay, this is what we're going to do. And it saved my life. Okay, and I'm not the only one. There are thousands and thousands of people with these stories. We have a, we've had these vaccines that supposedly were rushed to market that don't prevent anything. We see that. I mean, Joe got jabbed about four or five times, still gets COVID. And so where are all these vaccines? Who paid for them? Where are they going? We don't even know the origin of this disease, whether it was a man-made. Here's something very suspicious, and I'm not a kook. 
I have to keep saying that because I know what conspiracy theories sound like. And as soon as something sounds like, eh, this is not kooky, though. We had, a, we had the biggest economic trade war with China under Donald Trump. And despite the fact that the American media did not report it, we won that trade war. We backed them up. They were conceding to stop stealing American intellectual property, to stop exporting rotten products over here, to stop manipulating the currency, and to also better economic terms on the trade imbalance. We won, unreported. As soon as they were in a position, and by the way, their economy was tanking for the first time since they rose to be almost the number one economic power in the world, their economy started to tank. What happened? They, all of a sudden, we get this disease out of Wuhan. First, we were told it was bats and it's at a wet market, even though there's no wet market 50, within 50 miles of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Okay, this disease took out Donald Trump's presidency, it took down America's economic status, and it raised China's economy back up. And yet no one questions whether this was an intentional act of retaliation when even our intelligence officers at the time were questioning it. And I know that because I was talking to members of our intelligence community who were telling me what they thought and how they thought this was originated. So there are so many layers to this. Right now, California just signed a measure, uh, Gav uh, Governor Gazem Newsom, that you, if you're a doctor and they accuse you of misinformation, they will punish you. What is misinformation? Misinformation, according to them, is going against whatever their medical board say is the standard COVID response. So if you if you have any questions now as a doctor, they will shut you down and punish you. This is unheard of in America. What does that say about the American? It's the American Medical Association, correct? No, it's the Cal, it's the California board. There are two different boards involved, and I have to get the exact names. But but it is their medical boards, and if you go against what they're saying, are the prescribed line of thought on COVID, you will be punished as a medical profession professional. Good God. This is stuff that had used to happen in Soviet Russia. I it's it's unthinkable. Um and I, I I we could we could go on for an hour just about that. Um but we're not going to because I, I promised you it'd be about a half hour. But James Mr. James Golden, your conviction and your love for this incredible nation is not just admirable, but it's inspiring and it gives me great hope. I, a microphone from WABC Radio in New York wields tremendous power and reach. And I've never once heard you abuse that power or misuse that reach. In fact, I think you wield it magnificently. You're a man who, at his core, is a true American, a devout one. And I admire you for your commitment to your craft and your fierce love for this country. And what it offers us, you don't shy away from your views and your values, yet you do it in a way that befits gentlemen, and you, you don't demean or demonize anyone. You're a great man, a great New Yorker, and I honestly think that has a lot to do with it. I'm proud to say that I love listening to you, and I'm eternally grateful for you to think enough of our podcast to come on and spend some of your valuable, some of your valuable time with us. So thank you so much, and God bless you, sir. It is my pleasure. I have looked forward to this. You do an amazing podcast. You are an amazing broadcaster. And the, I, I'm telling you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I really do appreciate you. And like I said, you get what I'm trying to do. You are the only one that I've spoken with in years that understands the scope of it. And thank you. I really appreciate it. Well, that really means a lot. Thank you so much, Mr. James Golden, ladies and gentlemen. And I look forward to talking to you again. Let's do it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. James Golden, a.k.a. Bo Snerdly, can be heard on 77 WABC Radio in New York, weekdays 4 to 5 p.m. and Saturdays 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And his broadcast is also available in podcast form, and we will leave that link on our website for you as well. Mr. James Golden, we are eternally grateful for you sharing your priceless knowledge, spirit, and insight on this incredible business and this incredible place that we now call New York. 
You're a scholar and a gentleman, mein friend, and we say to you, verdammt. <laughs>